to the breakout session for the climate resi um, climate for the pathway for the climate resilient communities. I'm Carlotta Arthur. I'm the executive director of the Division of Behavioral and Social Sciences and Education, and DBAS is what how we uh, the acronym that we use for that division is home for this particular pathway, uh, which is one of four pathways under the Climate Crossroads Initiative. We're really thrilled to be the home for this pathway. DBAS is also home to several boards and units that do work in this space already. Um, we have the Board on Environmental Change in Society, the Board on Children, Youth and Families, the Board on Science Education, among others. And so this was the natural home for this particular pathway which is really a key pathway for conducting work under the Climate Crossroads Initiative. Um, we also have a strong reputation for collaborating across the institution with other divisions and look forward to conducting work. Some of that interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary work that was discussed this morning as we all work together to address these challenges. In fact, as I was listening this morning, I kept hearing some recurring themes I kept hearing um, Dr. McNutt, for example, mention the impacts of climate change across all sectors of society and uh, the importance of thinking about what climate change means for people, as well as approaches for mitigating climate change, that it would be important for us to create roadmaps for addressing climate change. And that's one of the things that we're gonna discuss with you here today. I also heard participants in the other panels talk about things like climate justice, the need for more social scientists, the human side of the equation. They talked about squishy things like trust and community um, and the fact that communities don't feel climate as a single issue. They feel it in a multi-dimensional uh, multi way. Um, they also talked about that there are all kinds of ways to solve these problems using innovative approaches. And we see this pathway as one of those innovative approaches. Um, the behavioral and social sciences and education have not always been at the table in conversations about climate. And yet, as you heard this morning, um, it's really an important uh, component of being able to do work uh, related to climate change. So I'm not gonna take up any more of your time. I'm gonna go ahead and turn things over to Natalie Nielsen, who's leading our division team, who is developing the pathway and uh, one of our colleagues, Austin, uh, couldn't be here today. So we really miss Austin, uh, but Natalie and the team are gonna do an excellent job of sharing the work uh, that, that the team has worked on. Thank you. Thank you, Carlotta. Hi, everybody, sorry while I get... Um, uh, hi, everybody, and welcome. Um, and I just want to add my thanks to Carlotta for um, all of you for being here and showing interest in the Climate Resilient Communities Pathway. And as Carlotta mentioned, I'm Natalie Nielsen. I'm a staff member with the Executive Office of DBAS. Um, and uh, with Austin Sheets, I am one of the core team members who's been working on the pathway. Um, some of you may have attended last year's summit. Um, and learned about the Climate Resilient Communities Pathway there. Um, others may have talked to us over the course of the last year as we've been scoping out the pathway. Um, today I'm going to share our progress to date and our plans for the future of the pathway. After my presentation, Dakota Fisher from FEMA and Julian Reyes from the Bureau of Land Management are going to um, offer their thoughts and reactions before we open up to the discussion to everyone um, who's in the room and joining us on Zoom. And I just wanna add that tomorrow we're having a second breakout session that um, we're, we've set up as a working session to, uh, for anyone who's interested to dig into the pathway. Um, and a little deeper and offer their ideas for future directions. Um, so if you don't get a chance to share your thoughts and reactions today, um, we welcome you to join us for tomorrow's session or at the table in tonight's showcase reception. As Carlotta mentioned, the Climate Resilient Communities Pathway is one of four pathways of the Climate Crossroads Initiative. 
Um, and you may know that Crossroads is an attempt to marshal the strengths and capabilities of the academies in an integrated and collaborative way to catalyze uh, action and be a leader in addressing climate change. Um, just parenthetically, the three other pathways are thriving ecosystems, the National Academies of Medicine's grant, uh, Health Equity and Climate Program, um, and deep, deep carbonization. Climate resilient communities and the ecosystems pathway both started from scratch, um, while the other two are building on existing reports um, on strategic direct directions. And because we started from scratch, we're able to mirror the spirit and intent of the larger Crossroads Initiative. Um, that is, we're being intentionally action-oriented and multidisciplinary uh, with the goal of transcending institutional boundaries. And because this pathway has community in its name, um, an important focus, and we recognize an important point of tension, is gonna be how to engage more deeply with communities um, of pr place, practice, and interest in ways that play to our traditional strengths. And the pathway is also, as Carlotta mentioned, an opportunity to bring the social and behavioral sciences and education to the forefront of discussions that are central to the issue of equitable community climate resilience and where these disciplines have much to contribute. So <clears throat> just to just the starting point. So the I um, realized that the layers of uh, definitions involved with this pathway are a little like the house that Jack built. The definition of resilience is a matter of some discussion, as is community climate, as is climate resilience, as is community climate resilience, as is equi equitable community climate resilience and adaptation. And my own view is that the, this pathway has an opportunity to update the seminal definition from the 2012 um, disaster um, resilience report um, because the field's understanding uh, of the issue has grown since then. It wasn't appropriate for us as we were scoping this pathway to adopt or um, come to consensus on a new definition because there isn't, um, it doesn't seem like there's really consensus about it. And as an outsider to this topic, I um, quickly learned that there are lots of different ways that um, of talking about resilience among the experts who operate in this space. But what we did was we started with this as our basis, but actually took an agnostic approach um, to definitional issues um, because what we did instead was started with a very broad conceptualization of the issue that will allow for expanding or refining definitions as a pathway develops. So the Climate Crossroads um, program was intentionally not prescriptive about the four pathways that fall underneath it. And we inherited the elements you see here on the right, which I just talked about um, as, you know, in defining what our pathway is. Um, as we started in on the scoping activity, we realized that we needed a little more structure. Um, so we also quickly realized that we needed to define the pathway in a way that demonstrates its complexity and highlights the types of issues that the social and behavioral sciences in particular are best poised to answer. So we added the two elements that you see on the left. So the, the broad vision was that we would develop a conceptual framework that would put some stakes in the ground about what the pathway would and wouldn't be um, and then we would use the framework to guide our analysis of the internal and external landscapes um, of relevant work at the National Academies and beyond, um, and then to develop pressing questions that the pathway will answer. So how did we do that? As I mentioned, the pathway, and Carlotta mentioned, the pathway is seated in the Executive Office of the Division of Behavioral and Social Sciences and Education, or DBAS, because it heavily involves the social and behavioral sciences, and it, because it transcends any of the single boards within DBAS that Carlotta mentioned, or even, a sing, even any single board in the institution or, or organizational unit. So to develop, to scope the pathway, we have engaged regularly with a core team of uh, DBAS directors, um, which you can see in the middle box here. Um, and these boards have been instrumental in uh, the initial scoping and conceptualization of the pathway. 
During the scoping process, we've also engaged with our internal colleagues in several divisions across the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine. Uh, and those colleagues have offered feedback and suggestions for issues that the pathway might address. And as I'll discuss later, we um, hope to deepen and continue those collaborations um, as we flesh out the pathway further. Um, we've also had some conversations over the past several months with a wide variety of external experts um, to learn about the landscapes beyond the National Academies and to begin socializing some of our ideas for the pathway. Um, we identified these experts through their associations with the National Academies, um, their participation in last year's summit, and referrals from our internal colleagues. And um, you know, we, as I mentioned, just like with our internal colleagues, we hope that these conversations are just the first and that we're going to broaden our connections with external experts and deepen and deepen our conversations with them. And the good news is that as we intended, uh, the, the input we got from all these sources shaped our thinking about the pathway, including the conceptual framework and the guiding questions, which I'm going to discuss next. Um. Joshua, I think I'm stuck. Oh, maybe I think, there, got it. Um, I, won't, I won't belabor this diagram, but you can engage more deeply with it tonight, at tonight's showcase exhibition and tomorrow if you attend the second breakout session. Um, at the most basic level, what we're saying is that equitable community climate resilience and adaptation is a result of interactions among climate and social systems affected by micro, meso, and macro contextual overlays. This framework isn't groundbreaking, intentionally so. We wanted something that people who work in this space could recognize, and we wanted to be as inclusive as possible so that there are there's room for contributions from areas that we might not have thought of if we had a more narrow conception. Um, to my mind, the defining features of uh, the of the pathway are its focus on systems and the fact that it places equity at the center and recognizes the headwinds created by long-standing structural inequities in every sector of our society. You, you'll notice from this diagram that we did not attempt to foreground any single climate system or any single social system or to draw any connections between any of them or to focus on causal relationships or any kind of mechanisms. Um, all of the social systems on the right are integral to thriving communities in general. The other elements of the graphic are what make this about climate resilience and adaptation. And focusing on the right side of the graphic, a community's capacity to respond and adapt to the effects of climate change depends on the strength and resources of its social systems. And these systems include structures for, gov structures for governance and decision making, systems related to people's health and well-being, the nature and strength of the workforce, uh, and financial and commercial institutions. Community climate resilience and adaptation also depend on the extent to which citizens are equipped with the knowledge and power to make informed decisions and the collective will to act on those decisions. Um, Joshua, can you advance it please, Joshua? Thank you. Um, so our scoping work so far has led us to five big questions that will drive the pathway. As with the conceptual frame, these questions are supposed to be broad and encompassing so that all of the relevant units within the institution who are gonna be driving this pathway can find a place for themselves to contribute. So we anticipate that our colleagues and, um, and the external partners and audiences that we engage with will naturally have more specific sub-questions that they've worked on already, uh, that they're interested in working on, um, or that they're, uh, um, or that they're um, wanting to explore more. So the intent of the pathway is to let those flowers bloom. In brief, question one is about defining and measuring equitable resilience and adaptation. Question two is about why it matters and conversely the consequences or implications of inaction. Question three and four are about how communities, their partners and the government can achieve those, their goals. 
And question five is about preparing and supporting individuals and populations um, within communities to contribute to equitable resilience and adaptation. And we intended this question to include everything related to K through 16 and informal education, workforce development and youth development. Next slide, please. So our scoping process also included an examination of the internal National Academy's landscape, as well as, an in, as well as an initial look at the external landscape of work that federal, state, and local agencies, NGOs, professional societies, and the like are doing in this space. Next slide, please. We did a very loose relative weighting of work from the National Academies over the past 15 years or so as it relates to different elements of, of the conceptual framework. So the top slice of the diagram refers to the systems on the, on the left and right sides of the diagram. You won't be surprised to see that we have a large body of work related to each of those individual systems. The second slice of the pyramid relates to the bottom arrow of our diagram, then the top arrow and the gray outline, and finally at the bottom, the double-sided yellow arrow in the middle of the diagram. So the punchline is that as we get closer and closer to the specific focus of this pathway, which is equitable community climate resilience and adaptation, the National Academies has less, has less work, although that body of work is growing. Um, we have even less work that conceptualizes community climate resilience and adaptation in the comprehensive way that we've done for this pathway. And that's not a bad thing. It just means that there's a need for this pathway and room for the contributions that it can make. Um, it also means that there's room to look at the broader knowledge um, at the top of the diagram through a new lens. Next slide, please. Next slide, please, Joshua. You got it. Oh, you want me to do it now? Okay, I can't. Okay, thanks, sorry. Um, this slide is an elaboration of the previous slide to identify some of the uh, substantive contributions to our understanding of this topic. So importantly, um, the body of work from the National Academies um, generally follows natural disciplinary boundaries um, and typically focus on, focuses on a single system or element of our framework at a time. So for example, looking at the left side of our diagram, we have a deep understanding of the functioning and dynamics of the climate system, of physical and um, infrastructural resilience, climate mitigation and decarbonization. And from the social and behavioral sciences, we know about each of the social systems on the right side of our graphic with a deep understanding of structural inequities in those systems. Uh, social and behavioral science has also given us a good understanding of human behaviors and decision making that can apply to this pathway, um, along with knowledge about communicating science that um, uh, and what helps and doesn't help people take up and act on scientific information. Um, that plus all the foundational work that our board on science education has done related to science literacy, effective science instruction, participatory science, and STEM workforce development is relevant to this pathway. Regardless of whether any of this research has been done with a specific focus on climate, all of it has implications um, for a community's capacity to make informed decisions about its priorities and identify uh, equitable solutions for resilience and adaptation. Am I on it? Oh, got it. Okay. So as I mentioned, we've had many conversations with representatives from federal, state, local government agencies and associations, NGOs, and other intermediaries who are working with communities on resilience and professional societies and member organizations. Um, in those conversations, we've tried to um, just get our arms around some of the work that's already going on and, um, you know, especially closer to the community level. Um, we've also directly asked the people we've been talking with how this pathway might add value to what's happening. So this slide summarizes some of the high level takeaways from those conversations. And the big headline is that there's a lot happening in terms of community climate resilience and adaptation at all levels, federal, um, state, regional, local. Um, the federal presence is very strong, but gaps remain at the handoff points from the federal level to other levels of the system. And at all levels, people were able to identify specific ways in which the National Academies could support and enhance ongoing efforts. So key contributions include um, 
using our convening power to connect communities with decision makers um, and providing informational resources um, that are grounded in research that can help communities validate what they're experiencing and connect those experiences to broader phenomena. Oh, wait, I wanted to say one more thing about that. Um, so uh, looking at this, um, um, Right, so we recognize the need, I want to. I just wanna say, we recognize the need to both extend our reach beyond our traditional federal audience and to tread with respect and sensitivity when we engage with different kinds of um, communities and audiences. And we think that finding ways to strike this balance is gonna be new and exciting territory for the pathway. Okay. So I hope you've gotten a sense of how different the, this pathway and the Crossroads Initiative are intended to be. Almost every possibility is, being, is available and being encouraged. Um, the Crossroads Initiative with the imprimatur of the Academy Presidents is encouraging us to think beyond our traditional activities and our traditional audiences and to be more action-oriented, collaborative, and interdisciplinary than ever. Um, we're embracing that charge, and we hope to use this pathway to deepen our scientific understanding, um, identify new levers for change, and maybe even explore the efficacy of some of those levers. So now that the scoping, the initial scoping period is done, it's time to more fully develop the pathway. Um, I'm not gonna read all of this slide, um, but currently our thinking is to have an informal internal advisory body that sits in the DBAS executive office and is made up of people from different units throughout the institution um, that are working on um, activities that are relevant to the pathway. It'll be kind of like a working group that brainstorms project ideas and keeps each other current um, uh, on, pro on projects that could be construed as falling under the pathway. And the idea is that this informal body would amplify the connections of ongoing work to the pathway so that we can aggregate it, each bit of work in the institution up to something that um, is greater than the sum of its parts. And while we're primarily thinking of this body as internal, we're also looking to engage external partners in the pathway. Our view is that strategic partnerships can advance the pathway when our strengths um, complement each other and when the partners can fill needed gaps for each other. Um, we also think a productive activity in year one will be to produce some derivative materials or other actionable information from our existing reports, such as from our societal um, experts action network, which we call Sean. And while all this is going on, we'll be seeking funding to support the pathway in subsequent years. So at this stage, we're hungry for concrete ideas that connect to the pathway in one way or another. Along those lines, we think a critical first step will be to add sub-questions to the five big guiding questions that I discussed earlier. These sub-questions are gonna be vital because they'll provide more specificity, um, they'll clarify the focus of each guiding question, and they'll point to directions for future work. Um, We've begun brainstorming a few of these sub-questions, which are shown in red here. Um, so I'm just showing them as examples. Um, a major focus for tomorrow's session um, is going to be to uh, for um, groups to identify um, more of these sub-questions along with project ideas that might help to address them. So if you're interested uh, in this, we'd love to hear from you tomorrow or at any other time. Um, that concludes my presentation, my part of the presentation. And now what we're going to do is we're going to give you a chance to have some input. Um, if you'd like to um, take out your phones, we've got um, a, a, and scan this QR code. You can respond to this question. Um, which guiding question are you most excited about? And um, feel free to add as much or little information as you like. Um, I mean, you know, if something immediately pops to your mind about a sub question or even a question that we're missing, please share any information that you would like to share. Um, we're going to leave this up so that you can scan it. Um, and while everybody's doing that, I'm going to first turn it over to um, Dakota Fisher from FEMA and, um, at, and to respond, share his thoughts, connect. Um, 
tell you a little about what he's working on in FEMA that's uh, related to this pathway um, and talk about react to what he's heard. And then after um, Dakota's finished, Julian Reyes from BLM is going to do the same. Um, so are we ready to move off this slide or should I keep this slide for everybody? Ready to move off? Okay. All right. Okay. So Dakota, would you like to start us off? Sure. Can everybody hear me? All right. I'm going to stay at the table because I'd like to try to create a slightly informal uh, welcoming environment. Hopefully this can be a conversation and not just a talking at uh, opportunity, but a talking to and with you all this afternoon. Um, so real quick, Dakota Fisher, I am an interagency project manager. I'll tell you what that means in a second, but I'm also the team lead for a new group of individuals coming together to focus on this topic that comes up quite often in this administration, uh, place-based or the topic of place-based assistance. And so we have a few different uh, projects and activities that we are currently working on right now within FEMA's new Office of Resilience Strategy and in particular within our interagency coordination branch. And so to dive right into that topic, uh, I'll try to be somewhat brief so I can hand it over to Julian and then we can get into the conversation itself. Um, there are two main tasks that our team within the place-based work stream, as we're calling it right now, within the Office of Resilience Strategy at FEMA are currently working on. Uh, those two topics are, broadly speaking, place-based assistance, uh, inclusive of place-based technical assistance and our ability to support the federal interagency and enhancing their capabilities of offering what is place-based assistance. We'll talk about that in a moment here. The other topic that we are working on and it's gonna sound a little bit similar in the way that I describe it. Uh, I support something called the Community Driven Relocation Subcommittee. And we do that in a slightly similar way to what we're trying to do with place-based in that we are working amongst the federal interagency to provide a convening space, a coordination space to assist in the enhancement of the federal government's ability to offer federal assistance for communities that have chosen or are in the process of choosing that, hey, maybe relocation is the most viable adaptation strategy for themselves, for their families, and in the place that they live. So to start us off, uh, first, the work that has enabled my ability to be able to talk to you all today about place-based, generally speaking, uh, it starts all with a task force called the Place-Based Technical Assistance Task Force. I am currently the project manager of this task force and it is stood up underneath what is known as the mid flag or the mid mitigation framework leadership group. The mid flag is one component of many of what is known as the national disaster recovery framework or the national recovery framework. Uh, and in part of this is the national mitigation strategy and the national mitigation framework and the national mitigation investment strategy. All of this was established by a presidential policy directive. It was PPD eight, uh, over a decade ago now. And what it provides us is, especially from the context of the mitigation framework leadership group in the mid flag is we have an interagency convening body of uh, like-minded, curious, inspired federal practitioners and a few SLTT members, state, local, tribal, and territorial partners who we get to engage with on a regular basis to drive home a, a capability for the federal government. Right now we do this through a task force model. Our task forces are the place-based technical assistance task force. We also are responsible for what is known as the national initiative to advance building codes through our building codes task force. And it does exactly what it sounds like. It's meant to provide a place for the federal government and federal employees to come together to promote and encourage and support the progression of building codes and energy codes back to the place-based technical assistance task force. We started convening as a task force representing 16 federal agencies and departments um, at the beginning of calendar year 2023. And at that time we were looking at what does it look like to work together as a collaborative to offer direct assistance to communities. And then we quickly realized, hey, there's actually a couple of federal interagency groups already doing this. If you are familiar, there's the Rural Partners Network, the Thriving Communities Network, the Fish Passage Interagency Working Group, the Energy 
interagency working group. There's a lot of federal interagency groups that are currently doing exactly that. They're working directly with communities, whatever that might mean in their context and the services that they're providing to offer, quote, direct assistance or place-based assistance to those communities. And so what we saw was an opportunity to help support and augment the work that they were doing by creating tangible deliverables and outcomes that we could then hand deliver to our interagency partners that enhanced their capabilities to offer the assistance that they, they, were, they sought to provide to customers, to survivors, to the end users, the state, local, tribal, and territorial partners that many of us work with. What we did was we looked at the entirety of the federal agencies and departments that were offering or aspiring to offer place-based assistance, the direct support of a community or a state, local, tribal, and territorial partner to match the assistance that they were requesting with their specific and unique needs that they identified alongside their federal partners. And what we realized was one, there seems to be a common gap identified across uh, the federal agencies that we work with and across the other interagency endeavors that I've uh, just referenced, where there's not a clear understanding of what we all collectively mean by place space. Natalie made a good point earlier about there's these words out here, resilience. Before resilience, it was sustainability. Now there's place based. There's always these words that are flying around across our worlds, right? Our collective worlds. Uh, operating in in this field, call it climate adaptation, call call uh, call it climate adaptation, call it resilience, call it long term disaster recovery and sustainability. Words matter though. Words matter whenever you are trying to engage one another. Words matter whenever you are especially trying to engage communities and most importantly the communities that oftentimes don't have all the time and the resources to go and learn everything there is to know about a certain topic. They want a clear understanding of what you have to offer, what you have to provide, and they want you to be supportive and be a supportive partner in providing that end result that they are looking for to meet their unique needs. And so what we did when we pushed away from providing, call it direct technical assistance or direct place-based assistance to communities, we instead said, hey, can we help solidify an understanding of what it means to offer place-based assistance? And can we provide services to our partners or can we provide a deliverable to our partners that then makes it that much easier for them to go and offer the assistance that they are already offering to those communities. And so what we did was we conducted a landscape analysis of the existing technical assistance programs that are out there. And what we did was we started doing preliminary analyses to understand of these technical assistance offerings can we start composing what might be considered place-based assistance? So what, what I hope you'll see is we started building, creating the building blocks to get that much further along to understanding what does it mean to offer place-based assistance? We created a landscape analysis summary report. From that deliverable, we then created what is known as a strategic guidance and recommendations document. It puts together strategies and actions that the interagency, whether it's my interagency task force, the place-based technical assistance task force, but also the other interagency endeavors, there are many of them out there, that they could take those actions and go perform them to enhance their offerings to their SLTT or state, local, tribal, and territorial partners. From there, we started providing clear examples of how these actions could be carried out. And then moving forward into the remainder of this year and into early next year, we are looking at taking specific actions such as we want to actually create a definition for place-based assistance. We want it to be really clear what we are talking about and help support other conversations other partners are having when they're addressing this topic that again, continues to be stated over and over again, and we don't always have a collective understanding. So what we are doing is we are going to, in this next phase of our work, starting quite literally right now, we're, we're scoping out the work and starting it in the next couple of weeks, we want to begin laying further laying the foundation to support federal colleagues, because that's what my task force, that's who they address. My, my customers at the beginning of the day are my federal colleagues on the task force who they themselves are then offering direct assistance to communities and with our community partners. We want to offer them these 
building blocks so that they can then have a enhanced uh, capability to do the work that they're aspiring to do. So that is our interagency task force and how we are addressing it. Within FEMA, we're actually taking a couple actions right now, and I can't talk much about this because this too is being scoped. We are taking action to formalize what is place-based assistance within our own agency, and we're doing that so through um, doctrine and policy development within our agency. From there, once we establish policy guidance for what it means to offer place-based assistance at FEMA, we then will take it the next step and we will be able to offer uh, and, and partner directly with our regional and our field offices to develop out guides and playbooks that help our partners within the agency better understand how they can conduct this type of assistance um, within their, their jobs, their programs, the authorities that they have. So that's a little bit about our, our place-based work. Um, I also wanna provide the group just an update of what we are doing uh, within the Community Driven Relocation Subcommittee. And so uh, we, uh, the, the Community Driven Relocation Subcommittee has been convening since early August of 2022. And the, the subcommittee was brought together by White House Council on Environmental Quality uh, during early fall of 2022 to support two main tenants uh, for the federal government in supporting relocation as a viable adaptation strategy. Uh, at that time, the Bureau of Indian Affairs were actually in the process uh, in getting ready to award several tribal communities grant funding for the purposes of either community relocation, protecting place, or um, managed retreat projects that they had the desire to implement. And the, the, pro the program that they established within BIA uh, was announced and the award amounts were announced by the president at the Tribal Nation Summit in 2022. The subcommittee comes together to support these activities uh, alongside our partners at BIA, recognizing that relocation as a adaptation strategy is, a, is very complex, it is very emotional, and if any of you are familiar with the GAO report from 2020 about climate migration and essentially our government, our, our overall challenge in having specific programs and funding sources and leadership for guiding or providing assistance for communities trying to relocate, it's disparate, it's hard to obtain, it's hard to piece together to enable a full-scale relocation project. And so we are trying to work with our BIA partners who are working directly with those tribes and supporting their ability to take not only that BIA funding, 25 million for some tribes, 5 million for others, which isn't enough, by the way, if you just think about how expensive it is to build out infrastructure and homes for many people, um, how to obtain other resources and to work with the tribe to find those other resources and plug that in so that they can then enable their full relocation efforts. The other component that we've been working on is just simply creating a report that speaks to the federal government's understanding of the challenge pertaining to relocation using foundational documents like the GA, the aforementioned GAO report, but also um, work that's already been conducted by partners like the National Academies through the Community Driven Relocation Report uh, from, uh, from the Gulf Coast. Um, but also partners like the Alaska Native Tribal Health Consortium and the state of Alaska, who recently published their unmet needs report uh, that speaks specifically to the mitigation or adaptation needs of tribal nations in Alaska who need support from the federal government, from the state government, so on and so forth. Using those as foundational documents, we have created a report and we're working to progress a report that can put forward recommendations for how the federal government takes that many more, just a couple more steps to try and make this very obvious challenge less challenging for the people that we seek to serve as public servants at the end of the day. I really condensed down a lot of the work that we're doing right now, but as I said, this is being conducted out of our, our place-based work stream in our interagency coordination branch. I hope it at least got some cogs turning. If anything, Julian, maybe it can give you something to, to tee you up a little bit, but uh, I'll stop there for the sake of time and toss it back to you, Natalie, or just right over to Julian. Well, um, thank you, Dakota. Um, and maybe after Julian um, talks, I'd really be interested to hear um, how you think the pathway could 
um, support advance that the the work that you discussed. But it was helpful to hear about that. Um, and then so Julian, and then I just want I forgot to tell everybody we'll show the Slido results after Julian talks, and then we'll open it up to um, questions and discussion within this room. Thanks, Dakota. I was I was augmenting my my talking points while you were talking, um, but I just want to reiterate what uh, Dr. McNutt said today this morning that really change moves at the speed of trust. And I really like this pathway because I think you're really contributing to that by building those relationships with communities, which we know can be difficult, especially within the constraints of what we're working with, with you know budget budgets and project timelines, and we know that that's not appropriate for those relationships we really need on the ground. Um, so what really excites me are questions three, four, and five around community level action, policies, coordination, and educational workforce development opportunities. And I have four themes around my remarks. First is on coordination and cohesion. Uh, second, place-based people-centered work to Dakota's point. Third, technical and human infrastructure. And finally, partnerships. Um, so on first, on coordination and cohesion, you know, since 2021, this administration has been building a whole of government effort on climate services, inclusive of data tools and technical assistance. And so, you know, building beyond the kind of ad hoc opportunistic approach from agencies to de develop and deliver climate services, but really creating that no wrong door approach so that, you know, someone knocks on NOAA's door, they have climate data, but they also need FEMA disaster assistance. It should not be on the user, on the stakeholder, to knock on multiple doors to find that information. That's that's the federal government's work to do a better job of coordinating. Uh, so in April of 2023, the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy published a federal framework and action plan for climate services and really provides a roadmap for how the federal government can be doing a better job to serve you all. And lo and behold, we have actually accomplished much of the recommendations in that report. Uh, in January of 2024, we stood up a subcommittee on climate services. So I know this is within the federal government, but really it's acting to represent the breadth and depth of federal climate services. So not just your NOAAs and NASAs, but housing and urban development, they are users of climate services and they are disseminating that information. That's also important. DHS has also represented multiple components, CBP, FEMA, all very important as part of these conversations. And so lots of of exciting work on coordination and cohesion where I think the national academies can really provide support, especially as we know the federal government cannot reach every community. So wherever the national academies can help to, you know, amplify the work of the federal government, I see a lot of kind of collaboration with this particular pathway on the climate services effort. On the second theme of place-based and people-centered work, there are a lot of activities within the federal government that aim to do that. We have the USDA Climate Hubs Program, we have the USGS Climate Adaptation Science Centers, and the NOAA Climate Adaptation Partnership, formerly RESA program, that aimed to kind of distill what's happening at the federal level down to the regional level. And many of these organizations already work with Cooperative Extension. As we heard this morning, you know, they have a footprint in the nearly 3,000 plus counties, right? They're already working with the trusted boundary organizations. And so, you know, these federal regional organizations can't reach everyone, but they're working with those who can act as force multipliers for many of our federal climate services. And so related to this pathway, I believe that national academies can also act as a force multiplier working within this ecosystem but also ensuring where you all are kind of bringing the non-federal expertise that we need as well um, on the third point around technical and human infrastructure i just want to reiterate you know someone made a comment uh when i was working at the white house about ai and replacing technical assistance you know i don't think uh -huh. that's true you know in my previous work at usda when working with farmers and ranchers people really matter. The culture and agriculture, I mean, it doesn't have to be agriculture, right? And so just realizing we have great tools, but it's really about the people, right? We need that connection. And there are so many issues with that. We need to, you know, we can't just have postdocs doing all the great stakeholder engagement work. We need to think, yeah, right? We have to think about how to incentivize these kind of long-term full-time equivalent jobs that are actually building those relationships, communicating, translating the great climate science, you know, I don't know how you're going to fix that, but I hope this pathway can also address that. Um, and that would also fit in with uh, question five around uh, workforce and educational opportunities, I believe. Um, also wanted to mention that when we think about climate services, it does also include capacity building and really thinking about more actionable climate science and services. You know, we have the fifth national climate assessment, which just came out in November of 2023 
you know, what can we do with that to make sure we're connecting folks with the latest and greatest science and using that as kind of a doorway to additional tools or resources. Um, and lastly, on partnerships. Um, so, you know, I currently work at the Bureau of Land Management. If you don't know, we administer over one tenth of the nation's land, and we also administer over 30% of the subsurface minerals. And so lots of opportunities around climate change and services and ensuring a lot of the work we do, whether it's on recreation, unfortunately, oil and gas, energy development is, you know, science-based, right? And so we are a super user of what exists across the federal government and outside. And so we need USGS science, we need NOAA, we need FEMA. Um, and so it, thinking about partnerships, we have to include both users and producers in this kind of ecosystem, but also realizing there are some uh, organizations that are very resource constrained. And so they leverage what already exists. And so again, this pathway I think is doing a great job of you know, thinking across borders, boundaries, and how to connect the dots. But you know, thinking about those users, I think keeping keeping those at the center and what do they really need? And, you know, in our perspective at BLM, it's already out there. We just need those connectors and those people to really kind of be navigators across technical assistance and tools. Um, and so, you know, I think this pathway can either be another navigator of sorts or create those pathways for navigation of climate services, again, data tools and people. Um, and with that, I think I'll end my remarks. Thank you. Great, thank you, Julian. Dakota. <laughs> Um, Dakota, did you want to respond to Julian before we show the Slido results and open it up to the broader everybody? I mean, just, you know, I mean, did Julian um, spur any of your thinking? That's what I'm saying. Yes, and I will say, so one of the opportunities that came up, honestly, prior to Julian and I speaking, uh, but whenever you were presenting, Natalie, I saw an opportunity for the pathway to support the work that we care about and the work that we do. And in particular, I spoke a lot about the federal government, the federal government. Federal government is a thing. It's got lots of money. There's lots of resources. IIJA, the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, the Inflation Reduction Act. There's lots of resources and money out there, but accessing the resources is oftentimes the challenge. And what my groups seek to do is provide support to federal employees who are then providing that assistance or working directly with their counterparts at the state, the local, the tribal, or the territory level who are providing that assistance. I spoke a lot about the Fed. So I engage with federal employees who are considering these challenges and trying to find ways to make this more effective. What I see as an opportunity for place-based assistance in particular is it's a, I see an opportunity for the, uh, the academies to convene experts across multiple, um, multiple portions of life, uh, academia, uh, NGOs, community-based organizations uh, to discuss, to, to, to have conversations and then develop research guidance um, that further enable the ability to offer place-based assistance. Uh, and so part of what we discuss in our in our in our newly formed team that's trying to really grapple with this nascent unclear term is what do we mean but also we grapple with the simple fact that in some ways we're talking about a mind shift a mindset shift or culture change we are talking about offering another option or ways that the federal government provides assistance to an end user, a customer, and work for FEMA, the survivors. And in part, that requires, again, research, guidance on what it means to offer place-based assistance and dare I say to evaluate and then say what is good, functional, effective place-based assistance, but it's also thinking about the societal changes or the just internal to agencies at apartment cultural changes that are needed that enable the work. That doesn't even start to also touch on the fact that most federal agencies, believe it or not, or at least a lot of the ones that offer technical assistance, they themselves are low capacity uh, agencies. They are wearing many different hats, uh, especially our, we hear it time and again from our regional and our field colleagues, they are over capacity. They're doing many things inclusive of, you know, making sure they are carrying out a program per the regulations, laws, and policies that enabled that program. 
which doesn't always give time to offer what is place-based assistance, which takes time, it takes money. Doing good, informed, inclusive, and equitable community engagement is not cheap. But if you do it correctly, and I think this might get to one of our questions, we create better solutions with the communities that we are supporting. If you bring along the members of a community to develop the strategies that are supposed to be serving them at the end of the day, they then see themselves and the work that is conducted as opposed to a, and I'm sure I'm preaching to the choir at this point, so apologies, and as opposed to a top-down approach where you just force a solution from a couple of influential, I'm sure intelligent individuals but that a community doesn't then see themselves in. So in summary, sorry, I kind of went down the rabbit hole there. In summary, I do think there is a great opportunity for the pathway to convene practitioners, communities, uh, the political class or the public servants working at the local level to talk about what it means for them to engage and to be supported by place-based assistance from the federal government. Great. Um, thank you, Dakota, for that um, addendum. Hey, um, Josh, before we go to the Slido results, because I know we might um, start to, um, people might start to um, transition out. Could you put the slideshow back up? Just thanks, Josh. Um, I just want to um, uh, remind you all that there's two other opportunities to engage with this pathway. One is at tonight's showcase reception, and then um, um, we're also having that second breakout session tomorrow uh, at 1.30 where um, it's really designed as working groups. You, you choose what question you're interested in. We're going to put people um, at tables based on uh, by, by guiding question and, you're, and each group is just going to dig into, um, into that question, explore it, identify issues, et cetera. Okay, so Josh, um, when, if you could show the Slido results, then we'll start our discussion. And then how we're gonna do this is um, we're gonna, because we have virtual, we have people on Zoom, I think. Um, and so what we're gonna do is we're gonna go kind of alternate. Um, if we've got questions in person, we're gonna take a couple of those and then we'll transition to take um, a, a, a virtual question. So. Um, as you're processing this information, does anybody have a, a, an opening salvo that they'd like to either ask a question or make a comment or anything? Oh, yep. Um, thanks. Uh, uh, my name is Chris Hendrickson. I'm a uh, uh, faculty at Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, but what I want to speak from is I'm also chair of the Transportation Research Board Division Committee. Uh, and I, I was just going to remark that uh, uh, Transportation Research Board has been involved in these sorts of issues for a number of years, of course, with a transportation focus and already involves uh, local stakeholders, uh, state stakeholders, and already has uh, various guidebooks on how to go about doing planning for resiliency and that sort of thing but for airports or roadways and that sort of thing. Uh, and I, I guess I'm just making a comment. I'm hoping you can take advantage of that uh, experience and seek out some synergies uh, from the TRB, both uh, at the federal level and also for the Pathways program itself. Uh, I, while transportation is the focus of Transportation Research Board, it inevitably ends up dealing with broader issues. For example, there's a specialty conference going on in Colorado in August on transportation, energy, and livable communities, uh, which I think has a lot of overlap with some of the topics that we're talking about here. So I'd urge you to try and seek out ways that you can take advantage of that experience and kind of the network that the National Academies has in, in this area. Yes, and thank you so much. That's exactly that's exactly the in, um, intent and spirit of the pathway. And um, uh, I'll I'll admit that time got away from us in the in the uh, as we were developing this um, this document. But um, we've been in con conversations with our friends from TRB and we're going to have um, after this summit's over we're going to have a, a kind of an in-depth conversation with them about what they've done um, what where they see themselves in the pathway um, and how they might um, and and what their interest is so thank you so much for that um, that nudge yes 
Hi, thanks so much for um, sharing what you've been doing. Um, it sounds like you've been working for a few years on this project since 2022. And I was wondering, could you give us an example of this you know, cross um, agency coordination and partnership on how you help a community that needed this? A specific example? Sure, so I'll, I'll utilize the example of relocation um, in particular. Uh, so through the Community Driven Relocation Subcommittee, I mentioned we were supporting the Bureau of Indian Affairs in particular, but we're also supporting our other interagency partners who are providing assistance to tribes more often than not, uh, in this case, for the purposes of relocation, manage retreat, protect in place initiatives that they're, they're working on. So in particular, our subcommittee, which works at the HQ and the national level, has uh, supported and facilitated the establishment of individual uh, similar groups, but at the more local level for uh, to work directly with the tribes receiving this assistance. So there was a group established of interagency members working in Alaska to support the native village of Newtok, for example, and the native village of Napakiak, who are both recipients of BIA's Voluntary Community Driven Relocation Program. And they have interagency engagements with the tribes where the tribes know have a, a place to go to to ask questions of their federal partners uh, with the work that they are conducting. So do you really take over funding to I don't I don't control any of the funding, but what I do is I offer the ability to facilitate, convene, help with coordination, because what we get time and again are questions about. Hey, Julian actually captured this really well. Somebody goes and asks a question of Noah. We'll use the data example again. Noah, you have this data. It provides you know X features, X variables about sea level rise. Um, but we really need to understand what this means during a Cat 3 100 year storm event and how it could potentially impact the community as opposed to Noah saying, I don't know. Julian knows or Noah knows he could go to somebody at FEMA, he can go to somebody at NASA. He's got partners. It's probably not a great example. I did my best, Julian. But he can go to somebody amongst the federal family and get the information for the user. Because to Julian's really great point earlier, it shouldn't be on the user to go find this information. We should be serving it up on a silver platter so that our communities have the ability to engage with the information and the resources in a much quicker or easier fashion. So this is how the data for a specific place you got an answer for that one. I think a good example is you can think yeah. about like your favorite hazard.gov, heat.gov, drop.gov, climate.gov, right? But kind of creating that no wrong door approach so that it doesn't matter which agency owns it, but rather you can easily find your way through all the various resources. So it's a shared knowledge, shared data stream across the various ecosystems of tools. Um, so one example is the Climate Mapping for Resilience and Adaptation Portal camera. So it contains uh, hazard data, forward-looking climate projections, um, and also technical and financial assistance. Um, but what camera does is provides an enabling environment for the sharing of climate data and resources. So one example is that North Carolina decided to copy that and create their own North Carolina Resilience Portal. And then they just rebranded it because they don't want to hear from the federal government. They want to hear from the, from North Carolina, right? So in that sense, they're helping North Carolinians with their own resource. Um, and I think Massachusetts may be doing something similar. So, you know, there are efforts that kind of go down the governance levels of helping communities, but it's kind of building these different pathways so that we can easily leverage existing resources that already exist, if, if that makes sense. Um, Thank, when, thanks, Julian. Yeah. I'm gonna, we're, we're going to see if there's any online questions for... Grace, do you have anybody that has a Zoom question? Yes. Um, Paul Mackey from Safe Street has a question. So you can go ahead and unmute yourself, Paul. OK. Um, so my name is uh, Paul Mackey. Um, and I was wondering, uh, you mentioned, uh, Mr. Fisher, that you had uh, Sorry, set Paul, up we a can't task force. hear you in the room right now. Oh, try again. OK. Uh, I, 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 Mr. Fisher mentioned that you had set up a, a task force on building regulations. And I uh, was wondering if you were thinking of maybe having a similar task force on transportation, uh, considering the uh, major impact that transportation has on, on uh, greenhouse gas emissions and other environmental issues, and, and considering the potential when you're rebuilding communities to maybe uh, rethink the transportation infrastructure. 
So if this is going to be an in-depth thing, I might suggest that you all connect. If, if, if for people who have um, questions for the government agencies, I might suggest that you continue these conversations um, with each other um, because we, we, right now we want to um, take the time to focus on the pathway, if that's all right. Um, so we can get his, we can get him connected with Dakota and Julian. Should we take another online, Grace? Um, that there's no online hands up at the moment. Okay. Any hands up in the room? Um, Philip Lapel from the MIT Washington office. So one of the questions was about how you help communities share information among themselves and connect to whatever things. And what I heard from you guys is some really great examples of making it easier to find federal resources and to get the federal agencies to work to with one another, et cetera. But what I don't really see is looking at and finding the organizations in the communities that are already doing things and figuring out how to meet them there and how to make your programs work for them. And I'm wondering, so it's, I mean, it's less top, you know, you've gone from the top part way down, but it's still a top down approach, it seems to me. And I'm wondering, um, you know, what your thoughts are about how to bring in the stuff that, that comes up from the existing community organizations working on all these problems. I think, um, you know, this morning, you know, Cooperative Extension was already mentioned as an existing boundary trusted organization, you know, working with the land grant institution. You know, I think I mentioned the federal government is very resource strapped. So we do rely on these community based organizations and extension, for example, to multi you know, amplify what we already have. I think one specific example is through USDA, the National Institute of Food and Agriculture is providing funding for partnerships with extension to work with universities to work with USDA and understanding that it's actually really important to fund partnerships. The unfortunate downside is that it's time based, it's gonna, the money will run out in a few years. So I think those types of partnerships are really important. Um, you know, I think most of our funding is usually based off of a deliverable, but you know, working with the community is not a deliverable. It's a long-term type thing that's hard to measure, but we know that the results are, you know, there's a lot of t tangible benefits to that, both outcomes and outputs, um, but that's really hard for the federal government to understand. So maybe the national academies can help the federal government understand the benefits of building these types of relationships, working with non-federal institutions. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think for the pathway, that's going to be um, a, a huge opportunity and a huge challenge, right? Because, uh, and, and this is, you know, why we're excited to learn from our, um, our friends who do this, um, try to do this at, from a federal national scope. Um, it, you know, you want your reach to be, um, you want your reach to be communities, and, and yet it's really hard to reach them all. So um, any pearls of wisdom about that, we are all ears. <laughs> Can I say something about that? So the NOAA Climate Assessment Partnership, they are basically working with them, uh, practically learning from those communities and passing that information to the federal government. We are learning from those communities that program, the NOAA uh, Climate Assessment Partnership program. Um, you had a question. Yeah, I got a couple things. Um, so Bradley Dean, I'm the director for flood and resilience policy at um, the Council on Environmental Quality. And so um, for the transportation question, TRB, if you want to link to that, TRB actually has a standing committee on extreme weather and climate change adaptation. So it's AMR 50. Um, so for the transportation person, you can get linked into that. And the federal government's linked into that because um, when I was at FEMA, I was on that. I'm still on it. Uh, DOT's on it. So that's an easy answer for that. Um, I think there's a couple things so like the, the federal government's actually pretty good at this. I don't think anyone knows that like FEMA has got a $250 million community engagement risk communication contract. It's also got a 1600 organization partnership network. Um, I know cause I used to run it. Um, you know, NOAA has weather ready nation. There's 11,000 weather ready nation ambassadors around the country. And I think one of the difficulties we run into is this expectation that the federal government is designed to provide tailored services at an individual or community level. And the federal government's not really designed that way. And so understanding how to manage those expectations and to work through organizations has been 
um, a key priority for a lot of agencies over the last couple years. I will also add that there are a significant number of federal regulations and policies that don't allow the federal agencies to do that very effectively. Um, and so I think we're trying to figure out workarounds in many cases for those. Um, if you can figure out how to get rid of the Paperwork Reduction Act, that'd be great. <laughs> or the Federal Advisory Committee Act. So much so that like this idea of matchmaking organizations, understanding those who have capacity and those do not, or expertise and need knowledge, is not something technically the federal government is legally allowed to do, because that would show preference to a community or a organization. And I think that there's an opportunity for, for this to be uh, a place where that level of matchmaking can happen, where those with resources or those with knowledge can be placed and matched with those that do not. So um, I just wanted to add that. Thank you. Green um, shirt oh, and then white shirt. Um, Sorry, I don't have your names or... Um. <laughs> uh, my name is Sean Hutchinson. My company's funded with several awards from Departments of Agriculture, Commerce, and Energy in commercialization and translational science. And on the suggestion of outreach with um, uh, communities, in particular, we do infrastructure for community driven decarbonization, among other things. But uh, the Rural Partners Network um, from USDA is a really great opportunity to do direct outreach with organizations. And that was recently set up with the um, current administration. So uh, rural Partners Network is a really good way of reaching these organizations, especially on the note of resilience. So, thank you. That's that's helpful. Okay. I guess mine's is more of a similar comment question, but like, for example, when it comes to the pathways, uh, NOAA has the Regional Ocean Partnerships, which is a collaboration between federal partners and non-federal partners, uh, and. Case in point, for example, um, there are certain tribal groups that can't access federal funds, so they reach out to one of the regional partnerships to get federal funds. This is something that uh, the pathways can kind of uh, assimilate along with uh, FEMA and um, uh, I've got the other, sorry. <laughs> that, can, that essentially can kind of incorporate uh, when it comes to you know helping out communities um, to kind of go forward when it comes to coastal, uh, not coastal resilience, climate resilience and relocation and things going forward from that. So, yeah. And are you at NOAA? No, I was a Canals Fellow last year, but I'm a researcher at UCLA. Ah, okay, great. Thank you. It, it, that spurs my um, thinking that I think we're going to be in touch with our, um, I think, you know, one of the things that, that I mentioned that we'd like to do on this pathway is to start to really engage more deeply with potential partners of, at all levels. And so um, I'm thinking that um, our federal friends are going to be probably called together for an expert meeting to help identify um, exactly what you're talking about, these maybe lesser known um, kind of networks. Um, so um, make sure you keep your inbox open for us. Oh yes, sorry. Well, sticking with the NOAA theme, um, NOAA's Office of Education also developed a really great theory of change around coastal community resilience. And I think there's quite a few pieces of that nugget you could pull from for the um, for your process as Great, well. thank you. Grace, do we have anybody online? Okay, anybody else? Oh yes, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I'm uh, Neil Leary from Dickinson College in Pennsylvania. Um, some of the work that I've done on climate resilience with our county uh, uh, commissioners and planning office and our uh, borough uh, uh, government, um, they're often interested in thinking about this question, you know, pathways of more sort of like, where are the points of like leverage and intervention? Um, and something I keep hearing from folks I work with are, are, you know, how do we make this part of our, you know, normal everyday work? You know, we don't want to have a climate resilience task force or plan or whatever. How does this connect with comprehensive planning, which we're required to do by the state of Pennsylvania? Um, how do we make this work with our water quality plan, which our Chesapeake Bay program requires of us? Um, uh, every community in Pennsylvania has to have, you know, a, a natural disaster or hazard uh, mitigation plan. So the thing is, so are the conversations on these pathways looking at where are the points of intervention that for communities, you know, provide opportunities to how do we make this part of the work we do as opposed to, Here's another task for low capacity jurisdictions of we can't set up another group, committee, 
hire folks? Is that, is that part of the conversation? Yes, for us it is, for sure. Did you guys want to say something? Agreed. Agreed. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, for us, for this pathway, um, we are exactly trying to identify because of this tension that that w those of us who operate at the federal or national level have been discussing. You know, it's very hard for us, given where our reach is, to reach everybody else, right? So we are looking exactly for those uh, more intermediate for this pathway. We're looking for the, those exactly those more intermediate. Um, points of leverage. And you're, you're exactly right. I mean, it, it's, it's like any reform that you're trying to do. You, it has to fit with people's priorities and what they're doing. Right. And so identifying what, you know, where it's happening, we started to talk with some resilience officers, you know, most of the States and, and a lot of, uh, and some cities now have um, resilience officers. So we were thinking that that's a network also where we can talk to them um, exactly about this kind of planning that's happening. Um, so thank you for that. Um, first you in the purple, are you in purple? Thank you. Municipal officials serve at the community level. Thank you. Um, and kind of just another version of what, you know, and I also am in an agricultural college, so which is kind of a place that has sort of the idea of adoption and diffusion of innovation uh, kind of is built into our DNA in a lot of ways. So just the, the point I want to make that I think picks up on what you said a little bit is thinking about different categories of places. You know, there isn't going to be the same solution for all places. And there are going to be, like I am also on my city's uh, Sustainability and Climate Justice Commission. And, you know, we're kind of, we're the kind of place that gets in the international press because of what we're trying to do. But I can go five miles from where I live to another municipality, and there may be a majority of people who are conflicted about whether climate change is something they should say in their community. So I'm just trying to say, thinking about, thinking about like the different, some kind of typology of places and a dynamic of how people learn across communities, because we view ourselves, for example, as trying to experiment and take risks that other places won't take so that we could try and figure it out and maybe offer some kind of lessons to other places. Yeah, and that, that's great. Um, and that's helpful because one of the things that we're, we've been talking about doing um, with this pathway is, ex is exactly what you're talking about, kind of connecting people who are trying. Um, and maybe they're trying and doing super well. Maybe they're trying and not doing super well. Maybe someone's not trying but wants to try. You know, so kind of um, connecting people who are working on or grappling with similar issues and are maybe at different places so that, um, you know, someone doesn't feel um, less than when they hear about your exemplary community, you know, so um, we're trying to think about how to create those types of learning communities within the pathway. So um, if you can make sure we have your name, that'd be great too. Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask a clarifying question to what you shared with Neil. So Neil had asked that great question about, you know, how do we incorporate to our existing system? And you talked about talking to like a climate resilience officer, but what if you don't have a climate resilience officer? What, what do you do then? Yeah, so so it's, I mean, it's a really, it's, um, it's a discovery process. I mean, we're in the very beginning. So we ha we are, you know, like the NOAA networks that that um, gentleman described, right? And the, uh, we, we, we are in the process of kind of unearthing um, where those leverage points are. Um, so if there's not a climate resilient officer, well, someone's doing strategic planning or, um, you know, someone's doing a plan for a community or a region or a state. So um, I don't think we're going to be able to unearth all of them, but, but it's, but it's exactly, I mean, we're, we're that's exactly what we're trying to figure out. Where are the leverage points? Um, where is going to get us the maximum leverage? And if they're, um, you know, in places that aren't, there aren't resilience officers, my guess is that people who operate at those levels know who the, who the actors are. We just haven't learned it all yet. If I emergency follow. offices. The emergency offices. Most <laughs> of the towns has the emergency team. They're working with the mayor, et cetera. Those are really... 
you in the south for instance where i work uh, you don't mention climate change in those offices but when you talk about emergency and then they pay attention so, yeah. exactly thank you mm -hmm. yeah if i could just follow up on, on sabrina's uh, uh, question um of and i think this tying it into the you know one of the five questions uh, that you have with you can't remember the in building capacities um mm -hmm. and so <laughs> different communities where we're you know some will have a resilience right. officer and office with staff and that's a different context than you know a rural county in pennsylvania where there's a planning office that does all the planning across the board with like four staff members and so thinking about the capacity building piece of this to you know Sabrina's point, I'd say that that question, an element of that might be thinking about, you know, in different kinds of communities, what are the sorts of resources, human resources, as well as other kinds of resources, um, and, and what are some strategies for trying to build those capacities in, in productive ways? Right. And that's that, right. And that, I think, requires a, a little bit of a better understanding of the, that landscape than we have at this moment in the pathway. But um, you know, I think it could be a productive vein to learn, oops, to learn how that, what that world kind of looks like, back to the typology issue, you know? Yes. Uh, I work for HUD Housing um, and Urban Development, the Office of Disaster Recovery, and I'm on the Face Place Task Force, but um, I also worked for FEMA. So I worked for FEMA in their hazard mitigation planning program. And now with HUD, we have planning requirements around how communities have to use our money. Um, so I'm really intrigued by what you propose because it is an issue. It was a big issue when I worked at FEMA. We had so many requirements about what our plan had to entail. Um, and there are communities that wanted to be able to leverage pre-existing plans to integrate our requirements in. And I think there's a couple examples of that, but it's certainly not the standard. It's more of like an exception. Um, and I just, I feel like there's multiple barriers. So who's doing the planning is number one. Planning and planning, the people doing planning for a comprehensive plan are not the same people who are doing our action plan for HUD. And they're not, emergency management is doing the hazard mitigation plan. So it's, it's very siloed at the local level. Um, so that's the first issue. And then the second issue is the regulatory requirements of what must be in some of these plans. Um, so I think that could be really interesting potential subcommittee um, for MITFLAG or for Pathways to look at an example of a place in the United States and where could we maybe do a regulatory crosswalk hmm. and make suggestions to local communities about how they could leverage plans. Thank you. That's really interesting. Are we going to compete for it, Dakota? <laughs> Any other questions? Well, um, we're beyond our time, but I really want to thank everybody for your participation, for your engagement, for your input. Um, I hope you, I, I, I hope it's clear that we are at the beginning of this journey and, and we are open um, to ideas and um, we are excited. And if you're interested, please get in touch with us and, um, and let us know more ideas and how, you know, you'd like to be involved. We'd appreciate it. Thank you very much.